Thank you for the wonderful lecture on preaching this morning. 70 years of black preaching, it was absolutely a phenomenal piece of work. Um, my first question out of the lecture, you talked about the Samuel DeWitt Proctor uh, method of preaching. And so everyone's not familiar with that method of preaching. So why don't you give us just a quick summary of the method? I think in his book, Preaching on Crisis in the Moral, Preaching on Moral Crisis in the Community, he outlined it himself. It's in one of his books in print. Um, but his position is he loved the Hegelian dialectical method. Mm -hmm. And when in homiletics classes you would talk together a thesis sermon, what is my thesis? What am I trying to say in this message? Mm -hmm. All right, that's your thesis. Start with the antithesis, just the opposite of what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. And now ask a relevant question of that text. And Dr. Proctor used to maintain that you could ask 52 different questions and preach 52 different sermons on the same text mm. because the question you are answering determines the body of your sermon. Right. Right. So what is a relevant question? Once you get your relevant question, then your, your response to that question is the synthesis, okay. which is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Okay. And the synthesis comes out of that question that you're raising with the text. Um, and what I was sharing in, in, the, in the class, I'll quickly. Sam Proctor is from Norfolk. His, his church is Bank Street Baptist Church. My uncle was his pastor. When he go to Philadelphia, he would go see my sister, his, uh, his pastor's sister. He knew the Hendersons. In fact, Tom Henderson, who's not a preacher, was his dean when he was president and became the president when he went to a and Well. When he was driving to Philadelphia to preach, he come by the dormitory. He said, Jeremiah, you want to ride to Philly this weekend? I said, yes, sir. He said, grab your dirty clothes. Come on, because I know you haven't washed. <laughs> and for five hours up and five hours back, he would drill me. Mm. Luke 15, 1 through 8. He's driving. All right, what's your thesis? <laughs> what would be the antithesis? What's the relevant question? All right, let me hear how you would respond to that question. You know, 35 miles later, he gave me another scripture. <laughs> Luke 10, 25 to 29. What's your thesis? Drilling me, making sure I understood his methodology. Um, and and it's, it's a fast, fascinating way of, of doing, I've forgotten the terminology you use on that scratch piece of paper. Mm -hmm. When you put, you're collecting free, ideas. Free a way of gathering your thoughts as to would this work with this text yeah. or not? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't work with all texts, right. but um, that was his method. So all these years of your preaching, um, you've been preaching in that method? I've been using in the, in the preparation stages, not always in the proclamation stages, because some, as I said, all texts don't fit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he, he's in the back of my head when I, start, when I sit down to prepare from the time I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, so his, his method is there, yes. yes. So usually when you, you know, carry on a method, so how many years of preach, how many years you've been preaching? I was licensed to preach in 1959. I was ordained in 1967. So how many years of preaching is that? My mind is slow. So how many preachers is it? Nine from 15 is 46 years. So if you've been working with the method for 46 years, I would assume that you've mastered it. Obviously, by hearing you preach, you've mastered it. So have you made any adjustments to the method? Have you updated the method? So what have you done with the method? The simple response is I have adapted, used different lead-ins, used different perspectives, uh, sometimes just tangentially looked at the method or doing something else. When Dr. Proctor started his DMM program, <clears throat> one of his assignments, and this is before computers, before, we, before your laptops, you were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He assigned us three different texts, just like he used to do in the car, mm -hmm. and told us to write three sermons on those three texts using his methodology. Mm -hmm. And then we had to mail our papers to each other to read them before we got to class because during the intensive, we would go around the table and critique each other's work. Mm -hmm. And halfway through that exercise, one week, approximately 10, 10 clergy persons, 30 different sermons into the exercise, 
Johnny Ray Youngblood interrupted the whole thing and said, Doc, 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 look around this table. <laughs> you got Amos <laughs> Brown, you, you got Otis Moss Jr., you got Mac Charles Jones, Charles you got Booth. Charles Booth, you got James Perkins, you got me, Jeremiah, Frank Reed. Count up the years, you got over 300 years of preaching here. You know, this feels like you're critiquing the way we make love. <laughs> Only he didn't say make love. <laughs> and everybody said, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> Dr. Proctor said to him, which is classic and true, in response to your question, he said, I am not critiquing. You know, Mr. Youngblood, there are many ways you could have chosen to say that. <laughs> but since you chose the way you chose, let me respond to you by saying I'm not critiquing the way you make love. I'm trying to teach you a new position. <laughs> <laughs> so learning different positions uh, is what I have come across the years to do, as well as disciples of Christ. This is important. At the National Convocation, 1977, uh, Fred Craddock was teaching homiletics, and I went to his classes. And hearing what he said and trying to do what he taught in that series at the National Convocation, uh, goes into my sermon preparation also, and what has gone into it since 77. Fred Craddock said, not in print, it was in a homiletics class at the National Convocation. He said, you know, Dwight Gooden, and I tell you, that dates it. Mm -hmm. He said, Dwight Gooden has the fastest ball recorded in the history of baseball, mm -hmm. the fastest fastball. His fastballs have been clocked over 100 miles, 120, 125 miles an hour. Mm -hmm so fast that the batter, the average batter, cannot see the ball when it's coming. Mm. And sometimes I would suspect the referee, I'm probably, I'm probably just guessing, because he can't see it either. He said, but if you notice, Dwight Gooden just doesn't throw a fastball. Because if he was throwing only fastballs, what the batters would start doing is watching his hand come up over his head and starting their swing right there, mm. knowing that if that ball makes contact with the bat, it's out of the park. Mm -hmm. He said, so he'll throw a fastball, slider, sinker, curve, change up, knuckleball, fastball, curve, fastball. He mixes them up so he doesn't get knocked out of the park. Okay. He said, I do the same thing with preaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just don't throw fastballs because they're going to knock me out of the park. If you take a text, give you three points and a hymn, they're going to knock you out of the park <laughs> halfway through your sermon. So some, I just, I use all kinds of variations and one of the disciples of Christ ministers said, well, give us an example, Fred. He said, sometimes I don't give my text at the beginning of the sermon. Yeah. I build a nest. And once I get my nest built, I drop the egg in. Mm -hmm. And the egg is the text. So, Show what you, mean, what you mean. Show us what you mean. <laughs> he said, have you guys heard of the cop who had the gambling, gambling problem? He was in Gamblers Anonymous. Said, oh, no. So yeah, he had a drinking problem and he had a gambling problem. He got free and clean of alcohol, stayed free and clean, but he couldn't get off this gambling thing. He, he would relapse every five, six months. Finally, he had two years of no gambling. Mm -hmm. Came home from work one day, his daughter was jumping hopscotch in front of the house, and he says to her, puts his hands above her eyes, she said, Daddy, I know that's you. <laughs> And he laughed, turned around and hugged her. He said, where's your mommy? She said, you got a new coat. He said, yeah, I got it at work. Where's mom? She's on the patio he, cooking dinner. He goes out to the patio. She's on the barbecue grill cooking dinner. He puts his arms around her to hug her. When he puts his arms around her, she says, baby, you got a new coat. He says, yeah. She said, oh, we don't have money to get Charmaine in the private school. We don't have money for her books. We don't have money for tuition. We don't have money for vacation, but you got money to buy a new coat. He said, no, 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 I didn't buy it. I, I wanted to, want it? <laughs> You're gambling again. He said, wait, let, please let me explain, please. No, there is no explanation. He said, please let me explain. I got to roll call this morning and Sarge pulled my name for crucifixion duty. And I went up on Calvary with the guys and they got the gambling over this man's coat in the middle and I just put my name in the hat and ever since I've had it on, I just feel like you don't have to worry about gambling anymore. You know, <laughs> something has come over me. <laughs> then he quotes, they gambled over my clothes. He, I built a nest, right. I put, put the text in. Uh, and he suggested, and I took seriously his suggestion that we take 
a look at different ways of presenting the gospel we weekly mm -hmm. so that people don't knock us out the park. So. Right, right. so what would be your best preaching moment from your own estimation? Mm, my best, I think I write about it in that book, What Makes You So Strong, it was one of the sermons. My, one of my, well, not one, the best, the most, the most effective, surprisingly effective preaching moment for me was when the Black Theology Project was in Cuba. Mm. Um, the year that we were asked to participate by Raul Suarez in the dedication of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center, right next to his church in Havana, Ebenezer Bautista Iglesia. And we had Y.T. Walker with us. We had, from Columbus, the rapping preacher, I forgot, he was with us. James Cone, er, er, Noel Erskine. We had some heavy hitters in that group, Black Theology Project. And Raul asked me to preach, which was scary in front of those guys and girls. Uh, Carolyn Knight was with us. Mm -hmm. And I preached on a Sunday night on the, on the dedication, and I, and I preached on um, the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how when your life seems to be at a dead end, that's not the dead end. Mm -hmm. Don't ever mistake a comma for a period. You think that's the end of the story. And to illustrate it, I use that famous, that famous story that Fred Sampson uses about the king has another move. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, all week long, starting that Monday, Raul asked me to do the preach, the sermon that following Sunday. When the Black Theology Project used to meet every year in Havana for the theological jornada on the life, work, and ministry of King, we had translators seated behind a glass partition who simul did simultaneous translation of the papers that were presented by theologians from North America, Central America, Caribbean, South America. When we left the United Methodist Church, First Methodist Church of Vedado and went out into the countryside, there were no simultaneous translations. Mm -hmm. So you had translators in little groups of four and five telling you what was what being said. My translator that I got close to and I rode the bus every time we were going somewhere was the same age as my oldest daughter, Janet. Mm -hmm. She had never been in the church. Mm. She had never heard the story of Jesus. Mm. She was not a communist yet. She had applied to the Communist Party. Mm. So I practiced my Spanish mm. and she practiced her English on the bus rides going different places. And because I had had Spanish from fourth grade to 11th grade, but if you don't use it constantly, so I'm trying to practice my Spanish and she's, and I'm telling her the story of Jesus in Spanish. Mm -hmm. She never heard that and she was interested. She said, I need your manuscript for your Sunday sermon. I said, I'll, I'll give it to you. Tuesday, we get on the bus, we're going out to Matanzas to the seminary. I need, I need your manuscript. I said, I'll give it to you when I, when I get it. She said, I must have it. I said, I'll give it to you. Wednesday, <laughs> she said, you haven't given me your manuscript yet. We were going somewhere to the Haitian community to look at the Haitian Cuban reality. I said, well, I can't give it to you till God gives it to me. <laughs> Now, to a non-church person, what are you talking? You sound like you're crazy. What do you mean God gives it to you? I said, the papers that you get from these theologians, ethicists, historians of religion, have technical terms that you have to trans... Sermons aren't like that. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about anything difficult. It's not going to be like that. There's no words you have to look up. She never heard a sermon. She had never heard a sermon. Friday, she's spastic. Mm. Wait, where's, where's the manuscript? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, I, I still don't have it. I promise you I'm gonna give it to you before Sunday. On Saturday, I gave her the manuscript. And when she got it, she said, gracias, gracias, gracias. Now, now, please observe this very important point. I might say something that's not in that manuscript. <laughs> and she says, por qué? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I said, well, I told you sermons are not like intellectual papers. Sermons are like the bread of heaven that you're feeding the flock of God. All of this is weird terminology. Look at it. 
I said, and sometimes God gives me some bread right out the oven. Mm. It's too hot to put on paper. <laughs> It'll burn the paper up. <laughs> She's looking at me. I said, don't worry. If I go off script, I'll let you know. I'll tell you. Okay, okay. Sunday night, while, while preaching about that period and comma and looks like a dead end, I'm working my way towards Fred's, Fred's sermon illustration about the Watts painting of uh, the audacity of hope or the audacity to hope. She was on the floor mm. because they didn't let women in the pulpit. Ebenezer Iglesia Bautista, the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she's got a music stand on the floor and I'm up in the pulpit. I get down to the end of my sermon. I was talking about when Dr. King was killed in 1968. It looked like period. That's the end of the movement. Mm -hmm. Now, please remember there's been a blockade in Cuba since 58. We're down there in 88. They don't know nothing about no. We have effectively shut Cuba out. So these young people, she's the same age as Janet, so she's born in 64. Okay. Four years before King was, was assassinated. She doesn't know what I'm talking about, but she's translating. And the worshipers are looking at me like Stonewall. What, 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 what are you saying? We thought it was all over. We thought that our movement was, they don't, what movement? What, I see I'm not getting through. And you know that look in your parishioner's eyes or in worshiper's eyes when your sermon is not connected. Yeah. And I'm saying, oh God, oh God, oh God. They don't understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to show how, how, how utterly hopeless it looked for us. And they're not getting this at all. And I'm, oh God, I can't reach them. And some bread came from heaven right at that point is when I started talking about Fred. Mm -hmm. uh, Fred's sermon, and I guess your viewers know it talks about how the woman has one string on her harp and, and no, that's, it was, excuse me, the Watt, Watts painting was not that painting. It was of the devil, Mephistopheles and Faust mm -hmm. at, at a chess table. Faust had a queen, a king and a pawn left. Mm -hmm. Maybe a bishop or one rook, four pieces. The devil had almost all of his men. He's sitting there leering. Mm -hmm. And the painting is called Checkmate. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every day tourists would go through, through the London gallery with the tour guide explaining how much the painting costs, who the artist was, what materials he used, how much is insured for Lords of London, move to the next painting, same thing, next painting. And this one day, nobody noticed that one man lingered behind in front of that paint, painting Checkmate. And they went to the next painting. He stayed right there, pacing back and forth, staring at the, the painting. Two paintings down, three paintings down. Next gallery over when they heard his voice coming through those marble halls. It's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. She's translating that. The king has another move. Well, <laughs> nobody knew he was the inter Russian international ch champion. Mm -hmm. To the ordinary eye, it looked like checkmate. Mm -hmm. the game is over. Right. To the master's eye, he could see a move the ordinary eye couldn't see. And I said the same thing happened in 1968. Mm -hmm. When King fell dead to the balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, or the Lorraine Hotel, it looked like checkmate. Mm -hmm. The game is all over, but God said, it's a lie. <laughs> the King has another move. <laughs> so by this time, some of our people are on their feet, right, <laughs> from, from the States. And I said, it gets better than that. One Friday afternoon at three o'clock. <laughs> When he bowed his head in death, the devil said, check me. <laughs> and all night, Friday night, it looked like she's translating that. All day Saturday, it looked like checkmate. <laughs> all day Saturday, all night Saturday night, it looked like checkmate. She's translating. I said, but early on Sunday morning, <laughs> the voice of God came booming through the corridors of time. It's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. Everybody in the church is on their feet now. The king has another move. The king always has another move. <laughs> and people are not looking at me, they're looking at her. I look over at her. She has stopped translating my sermon and had accepted Jesus Christ as her savior. <laughs> I was praising God at the, at the music stand. That's the most effective <laughs> moment I've ever experienced. And man, you're talking about feeling humbled. Mm. They're just all week long telling her the story of Jesus and then preaching about it on Sunday. <laughs> she gave up applying to the Communist Party and became a Christian. Wow, wow. That for me is the most effective. 
So let's go to the other side. What, what's been the tough, what was the, the toughest preaching assignment for you? I'll give you two instances. One, reason I said I'm not quite sure. One, I, there is a sermon I preached called the toughest sermon I ever preached. Did you ever hear that? I've never, never heard it. Uh-uh. Yeah, that was, seven, that was the year you joined, but you didn't join until New Year's Eve. Yeah, New Year's Eve. In 77, <clears throat> 1977, my wife and I divorced. Mm. And I preached a sermon, the toughest sermon I ever preached on Marriage Sunday (laughs) as a divorced pastor Mm -hmm. with two little children, 13 and 12, looking at me Mm -hmm. and how tough it was to preach about God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness Mm -hmm. when your marriage has ended. The title of that sermon is the toughest sermon I ever preached. And I talked about how difficult it was to try to preach. given the personal circumstances through which we were living mm-hmm. at that point. Um, one of our members whom you know and love, Judge R. Eugene Pynchon, yeah. his advice to me helped me make it through that sermon, through that season. He said, you were not called to be the gospel. Mm-hmm. You're called to preach the gospel. Um, and the next most difficult sermon I ever had to preach in my estimation would be the Sunday I finally preached about what happened to me in 1975. I mentioned it in class today, but I didn't go into any detail. In 1975, our denomination voted to ordain homosexuals. At that general synod of our denomination, I was made aware of just how homophobic I had been and didn't know I was homophobic. And when I heard the presentation made to us by the chairperson of the Gay Caucus, it rearranged all the furniture in my head Mm -hmm. to such an extent that I couldn't preach, I couldn't talk, I couldn't talk about it for four years. Mm -hmm. And four years later, I I took a deep breath and bit the bullet Mm -hmm. and preached a sermon that's imprint, Good News for Homosexuals. Mm -hmm. And that was very difficult because, and tough for me to do because I knew I was, going out in the waters where people didn't want to hear anything about what I was saying. That means their minds were as made up and many of them were as sometimes unconsciously homophobic as I had been. I wasn't even conscious of how, how homophobic I was until I was confronted with my own feelings and my own thoughts. Um, and not knowing how the congregation would accept it was, was scary. It was very scary. Um, by God's grace and providence, it turned out it was a blessing that changed the life of our church. It opened the floodgates for members who were gay, lesbian, transgender, to feel they could come talk to their pastor without being condemned. Mm -hmm. It opened the floodgates for members whose kids were gay to feel they had somebody they could talk to and answer some tough questions that one of the persons you know, she wrote the book, My Rose, Her Son Died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. She said to me, Pastor, why did God let me carry this boy in my belly for nine months and he's going straight to hell the day his feet hit the ground? Mm -hmm. I don't understand a God like that. Well, it turned out to be a blessing, but I was scared. I said, I know they're going to be calling the meeting to put me me out of here uh, on that sermon. But but what I did again was was a Sam Proctor, Fred Craddock thing. Mm -hmm. I was preaching a Lenten series of sermons uh, at the cross at the cross and then each week I would talk about somebody else who was at the cross. You know, Mary, the mother of John was at the cross. John was at the cross. The mother of Jesus was at the cross. The Sundays leading up to Lent. And that Sunday I preached about the Roman centurion. Now in the black church, when there are gospel music concerts, if you look at the bottom of the program, almost inevitably you see an asterisk saying, program subject to change. (laughs) Sometimes they'll add following the leadings of the Holy Spirit. And I use as a subtitle that Sunday at the cross, program subject to change, caution. The Roman military man was programmed to look down his noses at Jews. He's an Italian program to have allegiance to the emperor and the emperor only, the empire. Mm -hmm. 
Roman centurions were not allowed to be married while they were on active duty. So he's got a mind set straight. I'm doing my job. This guy says he's, a, the sign says he's king of the Jews in three different languages. He ain't no king of the Jews. He's an insurrectionist just like these other two. That's how he was programmed. But he got too close to that cross. <laughs> and when he got close to the cross, he hollered out, surely this must be the son of God. Well, using that as the hook, I talked about how I was programmed to think of, sir, you stay away from them people. Well, Bernie Mac said, don't nobody be walking like this here. I mean, stay away from them. That's how I was programmed. I was just raised that way. Anybody ever bother me, touch me, not, but I was just programmed. That's, you don't, you, mm -mm. And my program was changed by God's spirits whispering, Am I, you know, something's wrong with you. Ain't nothing wrong with him. <laughs> well, that, but that was difficult. That, that Sunday, I had butterflies. You know how you have butterflies before you preach? I had butterflies all through the sermon, <laughs> during the invitation, <laughs> up to the benediction. <laughs> But uh, that was, I would say, the toughest, most difficult. So could you define black preaching for me? Uh, it is preaching, and I'll use a variation of definitions used in the classes I teach. Uh, all theology, as you know, is contextual, and it is preaching that comes out of the context of the African-American experience, uh, where the combination of scripture and the cultural, historical, contemporary reality for African-American people intersect. Okay. Um, that's black preaching. It's not all prophetic. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is pastoral and priestly, priestly in terms of people like, my son just died. What is God saying? Mm -hmm. How did he die? He died in gang violence. He was standing. Like Miller said last night, I was standing next to, I'm at Morgan State, I'm standing next to my, my ace Boone Coon who's from Morehouse, he shot and killed to death. Now what's God, what's God got to say about that? That kind of black cultural reality, ain't no drive-bys in Highland Park, in rich white neighborhoods. That reality, trying to have an after-school program you can't have an after-school program on the south side of Chicago because kids got to get on the bus and cross three or four gang territory lines. That cultural reality is a very different cultural reality than Evanston, mm -hmm. Illinois. So a combination of the, the reality, the lived reality of those persons, African-American in the congregation. And what the gospel of Jesus Christ says, the word of God says, and where's the intersectionality? And that's, that's my definition of black preaching. This morning you spent some time talking about non-seminary trained preachers and seminary trained preachers. So uh, does one really need seminary to be a really good preacher? I believe they do. And I can defend my prejudice and my bias. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you say, a, the last part of your question, a really good preacher, um, one, who can plumb the depths of what the Word of God is saying and not just do a powerful story and an illustration to get folk to join or on their feet, but to really open up, open up what that scripture is saying. I think seminary training is an absolute requirement in terms of helping them to become better, more effective preachers, yeah. So what then would be the characteristics of a, a good preacher or an effective preacher? One who makes, the, the Word of God, one who makes the story of Jesus, one who makes the transformative nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ come alive in the hearts and lives of those before him or her every Sunday, every Sunday. Um, to me, also effective would be messages that reach every socioeconomic level and every age level sitting in the congregation. Mm -hmm. That to me is, is, the, is one of the hallmarks of being a good preacher, an excellent preacher in the black preaching, preaching tradition. Tell me about, um, you had to preach your mother's and your father's funeral, I believe. <laughs> um, so tell me, about, tell me about that preaching task. <laughs> you were there, you were there both times. <laughs> 
But when my mother died, when I stood up to preach, I said, uh, I said, I've been preparing for this one for 22 years. I had 22 years to prepare for it. Um, I knew I was 22 years before my mom died, which would be 19 years, 18 years before my father died. <coughs> my parents made it known in writing that I was to do their sermon, their, their eulogies, uh, with their pastor signing off, notarized by the public, notary public, that he was giving me permission to preach their funerals. In case he died, his successor wouldn't know he'd given permission for me to preach, to preach their funerals. Um, the preparation and the proclamation pieces are way, the ways in which I want to answer your question. Preparation. Um, when I got this notarized piece of information from my mother and father and saw they had planned their whole service, who they wanted to read the scripture, what songs they wanted, what scriptures they wanted read. Um, I looked down and saw my name and I called my mother immediately. I said, I got your, I got your information. Good, put it in a safe place. You got a safety deposit box? I said, yes, ma'am. That's not why I called you. Why did you call me? I said, because you got me down doing your sermon and my daddy's sermon too. I can't do that. My mother said, what do you mean you can't do that? I said, mommy, you're my mommy. <laughs> I'm going to be snotting and crying, trying to preach. She said, boy, if you think death is the end of this thing, what the hell are you preaching on Sunday? <laughs> Maybe you need another job. Maybe you need to just drive an 18 wheeler <laughs> or something. So, oh, okay. She said, I'm going to see you again if you live right. <laughs> Well, in terms of being prepared and prep preparing the message, it was no problem from that point on when she put that in perspective for me. Mm -hmm. If really Jesus has become the first fruits of them that sleep, if he's not risen, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, not risen from the dead, we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe that this is not the end of this? Okay, I got it, I got it, okay. Now the actual proclamation in terms of that emotional moment for my dad's, my mother was a piece of cake because I've been through it with daddy, but for my, my dad's funeral, I was sitting with the family in the wake, the, the visitation hour, and people from Trinity, we're in Philadelphia, started coming by shaking my hand. And the more people from Trinity came by, the more choked up I was getting. People who made a sacrifice of time and money to come all the way to Philadelphia to, to be with me for my daddy's funeral. And they kept coming and I told my wife, Rayma, I said, I, I, I gotta go, I'm going in the back. She said, what's wrong? I said, I'm getting ready to cry. She said, well, you gonna see these people after the service? I said, but I'll be through then. <laughs> I, can't, I can't break down now. Uh, I'm going in the back. So I excused myself from the family, went back to the pastor's study and pulled myself together and got ready to preach. Five, 10 minutes to 11, I came out into the, the, the prelude was going on, organ prelude. I came out into the sanctuary. And when I went up into the pulpit, they started putting chairs down in the pulpit because a busload of Trinity folk had just pulled up. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that busload of folk, the water started coming again. I said, oh God, oh God, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't. Charles Adams saw me. He saw me about to break down. And Charles Adams came across that divided chancel and came over to me and leaned over to me and said, Jerry, you have one job today. That's preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all you got to do. <laughs> I said, yeah, that is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I could be crying. I can get teary later and emotional and reminisce later. But my job at this moment is to preach the gospel. And the gospel says this is not the end. Mm -hmm. So those, that's what it was like in those, those moments. As I say, when mommy died, uh, I had 22 years to prepare for that, so I just had fun reliving her life as I tried to craft the eulogy about her life and her dedication to the gospel. One more. Well, tell me about the last sermon as the senior pastor of Trinity United Church. I don't even remember what it was. I really don't. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I don't, and I don't remember for, for several reasons. One. We had a succession plan, and when my successor came in, his first six months, 
He preached once a Sunday. I preached twice. Okay. From January of his second year until December of that, that year, I would preach up until June. We, st we switched it in June. For a whole year, he did one, I did two. For the next year, he did two and I did one. Mm -hmm. I was easing myself away from the congregation. Uh, and we never told them who was preaching when. They'd find out <laughs> when they got there. And sometimes, you know how members come in trying to see who's in the center chair. <laughs> we would blow their minds because I'd be sitting over here, he's in the center chair, and I'd get up and preach. <laughs> they didn't know who was, who was preaching. And, and, and with that flipping back and forth like that, I really don't remember. Because remember, I went on sabbatical, so it would be the last Sunday in February that I preached. Um, and that was it. I preached at one time that, that last Sunday in February. And that first Sunday in March, I was gone. Mm -hmm. um, three different guest preachers preached that first Sunday in March. We left on vacation the next day, Monday, Monday, March 2nd. And I don't remember. I remember getting them ready in a series of sermons, moving up to my last time there. Um, but, but I don't remember the, the, the exact sermon on the, on the fourth Sunday in February. What advice would you give to young preachers? Um, probably the, the same advice my father gave me. <laughs> when I was scared to death. Uh, Charles Adams, whom I mentioned this morning, Gordon, Gordon Blaine Hancock's great nephew, was one of my preaching mentors, heroes from the time I was in Virginia Union undergrad, because he used to come to Richmond to preach for his uncle. I was just amazed with him. And when he started coming to our church, the first year, second year he came to our church, 76, the year before you, you joined, he started inviting me to come to his church. And I always had an excuse. I had no wish, desire ever to be anywhere near his pulpit, <laughs> ever. 67, 77, 78, 79. In 78, October 78, he came as he did once a year. And after our sanctuary choir sang the sermonic hymn, he stood up and acknowledged everybody. And then he said, uh, I'm inviting this choir to come do a concert for my ninth anniversary at Hartford Memorial. Everybody clapped. He said, I also want you to sing at the 11 o'clock service that morning because your pastor will be preaching my anniversary service. And they clapped again. I didn't clap. <laughs> so you don't trick me into coming up there because I, no matter what Sunday he asked me to come, I always had a conflict, always on purpose. Well, can't you come on April? I got a funeral that day. I mean, here, here we are in October. <laughs> As we got closer and closer, I got more and more nervous. And that Saturday night before I preached, as always, my dad called. We called each other on Saturday night. And he said, are you ghost up? And I said, no, sir. He said, what did you say? I said, no, sir. He said, boy, it's 10 o'clock at night. I said, I, I know what to, he said, well, what's wrong? I said, I got to preach at Charles Adams Church in the morning. He said, and I said, I can't preach like Charles Adams. He said, my advice to young ministers, God didn't call you to preach like Charles Adams. God called you to preach like Jeremiah Wright. Mm -hmm. Be Jeremiah Wright. Preach your 10 cent sermon and go on back home. They know they love you. They, they don't know who their pastor is. They love him. Your people love you. Be who you are. Be who, find your own voice. John Bryant says something very cute. It's already to be a copycat as long as you know what's the cat to copy. You can use methodologies and, and different techniques that you get from Frank Thomas, from Alan Buzak, from Charles Adams, from Gina Stewart, from Anita Wee, from Claudette Copeland, but that ain't you. Be you. And young preachers need to be themselves and let God speak through them because God called them. I just was sharing with ministers, my women ministers, God called you to be a minister, not a man. Mm. Stop trying to preach like a man, preach like you. Right. Use your own voice. And I think that would be the advice I would give young preachers, preach, God called you to preach. Right. Embrace that call and develop your preaching, your preaching and your voice and use it to the glory of God. What question would you like to 
respond to that I didn't ask? What am I doing here? Oh. <laughs> um, I heard you mention with one of your students, Judges 19, yeah. those terror texts and the difficult texts like Renita Weems saying, well, better than Renita Weems, not better than, similar to Renita. There's a book that I did not mention this weekend while being with you and your students, in which Alan Buzak has a chapter, Mitri Raheb's book. Have you seen it, M-I-T-R-I Raheb? Um, he edited a book called The Biblical Text in the Context of Occupation. Mm. Those are as difficult texts to preach as the terror texts of women getting raped and mm -hmm. slavery. And oversimplified, Here's, here is the question raised in chapter after chapter after chapter in that book, approached from different levels by Christian clergy, Palestinian Christians. The narrative we know and embrace is that God led the people of promise out of Egypt using Moses to lead them out of slavery into the wilderness for 40 years. At the end of 40 years, he goes up into a mountain and gets a private burial service. Joshua leads them across the Jordan River into what? What does he lead them into? What do we say in our churches? The into the promised land. And the question the biblical text raises, what, what kind of God you got that done promised you my land? Mm. Mm -hmm. Explain that. <laughs> well, well, the question that wasn't asked is, how do you preach those texts? Mm -hmm. Freddie Hayes, when I gave him that book, Freddie Hayes said, I can't preach nothing else from the Old Testament. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said, this is the land I promised, I swore to your forefathers. No, hold on, is that God or is that you justifying taking over somebody else's land? How do we, in the context of Palestine today, how do we, in the context of South Africa, Having, I mentioned some names today, people never heard Khoi and San. They don't know what that, yeah. that country was taken from them, right. occupied by foreigners who now claim that that's their land. This country was taken from its original. How do you preach the word of God in that context? Uh, and my, my qu question that wasn't asked is how do, you, how do you get clergy, how do you get seminarians, how do you get preachers to wrestle with those texts and come out with some good news that for the folk who are occupied, it ain't good news at all. Mm -hmm. Where is the word of God in terms of good news for them in light of those texts? Well, we appreciate you taking the time. We've had a you know, wonderful couple of days with you and you've been generous with your time and we're very appreciative and we believe that your life and your ministry is a testimony to what God can do when you offer yourself in service. And it's an excellent model for our students, for those of us who have come under you across the years. And thank you for so much that I don't have words to tell you. Thank you for. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Man.